Um, I'm happy to present you our software. Uh, it's nice to see they were interested in it. So we have two hours. We have plenty of time to go through how the software runs, what, out, what outputs are produced. We can look at the intermediate outputs. We can look at um, what are the common um, moments where the pipeline stops. So questions that people ask me all the time, why they don't have like final results and so on. So yeah, so I will just share some slides to you, uh, with you and we can start. Can you see the whole screen or the, or the shared, the, the whole, the whole, right. Okay. Can you see my mouse also? Good. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So this, so this class today is about Mito Hi-Fi, right? So Mito Hi-Fi is a pipeline, a Python pipeline, which basically concatenates or orders lots of different other softwares to finish uh, assemblies and annotation for mitochondrial genomes uh, of different taxa. I will show you what Mito Hi-Fi can do. Um, yeah, and it's published on BMC Bioinformatics if you would like to have a look. So uh, basically I, I developed this uh, together with Xuan, which is my PhD student and lots of other co-authors and collaborators. Um, so I'll just tell you who, who I am. So I am a senior bioinformatician at the Sanger Institute. I work in the Tree of Life assembly team uh, in the Tree of Life department uh, at the Darwin Tree of Life uh, project where we are aiming to sequence 70,000 species. Uh, all the eukaryotes that live in, around, and on Britain and Ireland. And in this project, we are automating pipelines to be able to do that, developing software, uh, doing sequencing assembly, and so on. Um, and the, so Mito Hi-Fi appeared, and the project also appeared in the, con in the context of the Earth Biogenome Project, which is the umbrella project of all of this project, including DITO. So DITO is a regional project, right? We have some other projects as well, which are like taxa related, for example, the vertebrate genomes project, but our project is regional um, uh, focus on a region. And we have many partners, just to tell you, because all the work that we do at the Senga wouldn't be possible if we didn't, we didn't have the taxonomists, field scientists that go to the field, collect the samples, you know, send to the lab uh, and so on. So here are our partners. And our goal is to generate high quality chromosomally complete reference genomes for all named eukaryotes um, that live in Britain and Ireland. We want to annotate these uh, genomes and release them openly. And it's not only the nuclear genomes that we are after, so we, are, what we also have the organelles, right? So that's why we are here today to learn more about Mito Hi-Fi, which is a software that we developed to um, assemble uh, mitochondrial genomes. So just to show you our progress, it's really exciting. So we have more than a thousand uh, genomes already published, uh, uh, openly available, uh, not necessarily with genome notes, but openly available to all already curated and openly available on the in, in INSDC databases. And we have many more coming. So we have more than like 2000 genomes in the pipeline. So the project is happening uh, and things are uh, happening. And basically for the Darwin Tree of Life, um, Central to our pipeline is PEC Bio Hi Fi reads. So I will just talk to you a little bit about this because Mito Hi Fi was developed to use these reads to assemble mitochondrial genomes. So we had lots of SQL tools, and now we have a review which produces a lot of PEC Bio data. And PEC Bio Hi Fi are basically like a long stretch of DNA sequence that also has very good quality per base. So basically just show you here what a PEC bio read and how a PEC bio hi fi read comes to be. If you consider this like the double strand of DNA that you want to sequence, PEC bio comes and uh, puts these harping adapters on the sequence, right? And then basically this single uh, sequencing basically give, uh, goes and sequences many passes of this double strand DNA here. And then basically by sequencing it many times, as we can see here, we can make a consensus out of this sequence. So now you, we have a very high, uh, long um, DNA stretch to work with, but you also have it in a high quality per base, which is unprecedented and which, which is really nice and really helps us um, to assemble genomes nicely. Also helps a lot us to separate this uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts 
uh, out of all of the DNA that is sequenced, as well as um, assembling contamination or bacteria that is present in the sample. So lots of people still ask about, oh, should I have a lab preparation to do my mitochondrial sequencing? Because should I enrich my sample? And the answer to that is most of the time, no. Because if you are sequencing a tissue that has mitochondria expressed on it, you will be able to pick it up and you will be able to assemble it using MitoHiFi, for example. So um, yeah, so basically PAC BioHiFi is in the core. It is the technology used to uh, as input for MitoHiFi. And then basically, as the project had started, we were working on the Darian Tree of Life. There were many species uh, coming through the pipeline and I was there assembling them. And then all the time I would identify contigs that would be mitochondria, you know? And then you go, oh, okay. So that's a mitogenome uh, by blasting or looking at it. And then I was just basically finishing it all by hand because it was, okay, so this is, so one thing that happens with assemblers as a mitochondria, a typical animal mitochondria, let's talk about the typical, which is not, you know, very typical for all the animals, but the ones that we, we know best, they are circular, no? So basically assemblers get confused and they sometimes just overlap a lot of the reason they just like make a concatenator of this mitochondria repeated many times. And then I would identify these contigs in the, in the genomes that were coming through. And I was like, okay, so now I need to uh, find the places where it overlaps, break it, you know, and then annotate. So by the, you know, when I started doing it manually and then more and more species were coming and the mitochondria were there, then we decided to automate it because uh, there are, I mean, it's simple, but there are many steps involved actually uh, into producing a final uh, mitochondrial sequence. So we decided to do the automation of it and then we wrote MitoHiFi. Um, so MitoHiFi is used to assemble most of the mitochondria of animals um, for the Darwin Tree of Life. I will talk to you about OTK a little bit more at the end about plants, but we are also going to use MitoHiFi for plants today. I will show you. And this is just like one uh, picture of the paper showing uh, lots of species that we used it and that it worked well um, for the assembly. Okay, so we have many more now. This was just for the publication. So here we, in this histogram, in the gray histogram, you see the size of the mitochondria assembled. So if you look at the fungi, like we have very large mitochondria, and then we have all the hymenopters here, the moths and butterflies, and all of the groups. Okay, so we have um, mollusks as well. We have vertebrates. We have lots of different um, taxa that mitohyphae. Uh, is able to assemble mitochondria uh, uh, with. And please interrupt me. You can interrupt me. I don't mind. Uh, it doesn't have to be at the end of the slide. You can just raise your hand and talk because I, I like questions, so it's fine. Okay, so let's talk about it. Right, so uh, what does MitoHiFi do? I, I'm not going to necessarily just show you like this fluxogram and go like, each step of what the pipeline does, but I just want to give you like a general overview. And then we will run um, three examples of MitoHiFi. And then with these three examples, we will look into the outputs and the intermediate outputs and, and so on. And then at the end, if you have questions, we can go back here and ask if something is not clear. But I will just give you a general uh, uh, overview now. Okay. So basically, your input for MitoHiFi will be reads. So you have to have uh, long reads which are high quality. So that means it needs to be PEC bio high five. Or we have this like duplex nanopore now, that would work as well. You can also try corrected PEC bio CLR reads because people ask me this, can I like have corrected PEC bio CLR reads? You can try. The quality of those reads are not as good. So you might need to polish at the end as well, but you can use them as well. As long as you have long, high quality reads, uh, the pipeline should work. And then you, you will need a close related reference mitochondrial genome. And we have a script uh, in the MitoHiFi pipeline that is going to download it for you. So you just need to give, we, we will run this today. So you just need to give the name of your species and it's going to use the NCBI taxonomy to find uh, on the database, the closest mitochondria to that sequence or a chloroplast, you can find a chloroplast as well. And if the closest uh, sequence is the sequence of the species itself, it's going to download that as long as it has a gene bank file with annotation, because we need a gene bank file with annotation. So sometimes you will have a reference on NCBI and you go like, oh, that's strange. So the script 
downloaded something that is further away from my species, but it's because the one that was there doesn't have an annotation. So we will look for an annotation as well, okay? So this would be the mode read. So the min minus R parameter would be for reads and the close related reference in FASTA and in GeneBank format. But if you already have an assembly because you have your reads and you did your first assembly with high Fiasm, high Canu, or you know you tried many different things and you have a bunch of contexts that you identify, some of them are mitochondria uh, by blast or by coverage, you, you see that they are there and you just want to try to finish the mitochondria from, from those contexts. Like you, you want to circularize it and find, you know, remove any redundancy that is there. Then you can give contexts to the pipeline as well. So this would be the minus C parameter instead of the minus R. So you give context and you will also give the close related reference in FASTA and GeneBank format, okay? So then after that, um, the pipeline will go through a series of steps. So I will go through them very quickly now. If we start from the reads, then the, pipe, then the pipeline is basically going to take your reads and your close related reference is going to map reads to the close related related reference. After uh, so mapping, selecting these reads, it's going to assemble it with high fiasm. After those reads are assembled, there is a series of um, layers of parsing these contig files, which is basically to try to clean them out and have only contigs that are really your mitochondria. So what do this like parsing does basically? So we know that we can have transferred mitochondrial genes to nuclear um, chromosomes, no? So this is called NUMS. Sometimes if you map your reads to your reference, you're gonna map NUMS there as well. So you end up assembling something that is much larger sometimes with very low coverage, like noisy, but it will be like a piece of a NUMS. So this parsing is going to identify that by, so there are a few, um, rules there. I, you don't need all the details. If you want more details, you can ask later. But we are going to fill out contigs by size. If they are too large, they are likely to be a num. If they are too small in relation to the reference, they are likely to be an incomplete mitochondria. So they are also discarded. So we filter layer, layer, layer. And then as soon as we have a set of contigs that we think are nice, then they are circularized. So we try to find if the ends of the contigs um, self blast with each other and you can also change the parameters of how much of self blast of the ends you want to use and then if we find it we cut this redundancy and then we annotate this um this mitochondria and then if it has all the genes we rotate it to start at this trna phenylalanine which is convention and then you have a final FASTA, which is your final FASTA sequence and your final annotation for the mitochondria okay deep breath we will look we will do all of this together. So don't worry, you know, you don't need to like necessarily understand everything right now, but it's basically what we are doing here. Can, and can if I, we- Can I just ask a quick thing? Um, you should take a deep breath as well. It's just... <laughs> um, no, I, I, I speak really fast, fast. Is, I know, I'm sorry. Is everybody, because uh, the audio is good, but is everybody finding the audio okay? Or, because uh, sometimes with Bluetooth headphones, if you change your microphone to the laptop microphone, it, it's sometimes better. Um, on the Mac, but if you're okay with it, then we'll leave it be. Yep, people are giving a thumbs up, so it's fine. Yep, go for okay, it. Okay, good. Okay, cool. Right, and if you start with context, then the pipeline is going to, it's not gonna run mapping and high fiasm, which, you know, it depends on where you are running it. If you don't have a lot of memory and uh, resources, then it's, it will be like lighter because you are just gonna do the blast step. So the context, the blast step, and then the filtering, and then the annotation. Okay, annotation is a bottleneck, I have to tell you. It's the one that takes longer uh, for now. Right, so here. So let's focus on the main results, uh, outputs. If if you have run MitoHiFi and you ran well and ended like correctly, then you're going to have a final FASTA, a final um, underscore mitogenome.fasta file, which is your mitochondria, and the annotation in gene bank format for that uh, sequence, okay? Then in your output folder, you will have a file called contigs underscore stats, which is interesting because it gives you information about what, what happened there, okay? So it's a table format and it will tell you that the related mitochondria, so the one that you downloaded to fish your reads is in this case, it's a generic uh, figure, but in this case it's like 16, um, 
KB in size and it has 37 genes annotated on it, okay? And then it goes showing you the results that you have for your run. So basically here, it, it tells you that the final mitogenome, which is this final sequence here in the top, right? Has no frame shifts, shifts found because we want to check that as well, no? To, you know, to be sure that we don't need to polish or that we are not taking like a piece of num as well. So there is no frame shifts found. This is the length, the final length is 29 KB. So we can already see that it's larger than the reference, right? But it's there. And it has the 37 genes as well, which is a good sign. So it seems like a same mitochondria. And here it says, was circular, it says true. So this means, people get confused about this. This means that this contig at the end had so the pipeline went there and the script that looks for the self blast and finds the overlaps between the ends found something and removed redundancy. Okay, so it removed redundancy, meaning it was a complete mitochondria that was starting again. So then it just removed. When it says false, so in this case here for the other sequence, we will talk about why other sequences appear as well, why we only don't have only one mitochondria at the end. Here we have a sequence. Um, that has less genes, but it's funny because it's the same size in this case. So it has less gene and it says false. Well, it can be many things in here, okay? It can also be, this 34 genes can also be an annotation problem because it's an automa automatic annotation. So sometimes it just misses because depending on the basis they are there, you can miss the tRNA or et cetera. When it says false, let's say you have all of the genes and you have a mitochondria that seems like the normal, the, like the okay size that you expect, you need to know a bit of the biology of what you are doing. Um, and then it says false. It's not necessarily, you don't have to be alarmed by it. You know, it's just, it just really means that it did a self blast and it didn't find overlaps between the ends. But it doesn't mean that you don't have a nice contig that is a mitochondria. So the reason why you don't have the self blast can be many things. It can be a repeat that is there and you're not finding it. So, you know, not necessarily you will find true all the time. So biology will be implicated in there. So you will need to investigate a little further to see if you have a complete mitochondria or not, or if you have a complete enough that you are happy already about working with that mitochondria. Um, and then you have a- chat. Sorry, quick question in chat. So you said that it can work with Oxford nanopore reads duplex, but does it work with the assemblies made with Oxford nanopore as well? Yeah, as long as you are uh, like you are happy with the polishing, with the with the QV quality, you know. So usually assembly nano, like nanopore assemblies need a lot, a lot of polishing. If you run a lot of polishing, and if you did a mercury plot and you look at the QV and you look at the contigs, they're fine and should be fine. Yeah. Just as an aside, uh, there is a session on mercury uh, in the third or fourth week uh, for BGA twenty three. But yes, uh, does that yeah, answer the question, Leo? Yeah, it's really important to understand how to calculate QV people if you're working with nuclear genomes, because uh, yeah, you can you can always try with noisy uh, contigs, but I mean, the output will be non-ideal and you probably need to, yeah, you probably need to polish after. Right, so then you will have like a pot like this for your final mito. And also within the intermediate folders, the mito hi fi outputs, you're gonna have the same plot for all of the other contigs that were assembled, okay? that were assembled and annotated. So you can see like gene order, for example, uh, we will look at the intermediate output soon. And you will have a plot like this for the coverage if you started from reads, because then you have the final mito and then we map all of the reads uh, that were filtered uh, to, to do the assembly of the mito back to the mitochondria. So then we can have a uh, first view of the coverage of that mitochondrial sequence that was um, assembled. So let me look at my time, right. Okay, right, so let's talk about this. Mito Hi Fi is on GitHub, okay? Um, you know how it is. We live in a time of bioinformatics where we collate lots of software together. So this is a nightmare, but there are uh, nice sides to it and nice tools that help us to minimize the hassle of installing everything so that we can make pipelines work. So Mito Hi Fi is written in Python. And the annotators, MitoFinder and Mitos, were written in Python 2. So we don't have a Conda environment for Mito Hi-Fi because we cannot have two 
concurrent Python versions in the same Conda environment. I'm really sorry. So what we did, we did a universe for Mito HiFi. We built up a Docker container. So basically the Docker container has everything set up so you can use it. So a Docker container can be executed with Docker or it can be executed with Singularity. So this requires uh, learning uh, how to use these tools, right? So, um, but at least if you have Docker set up or Singularity set up, you, 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 you will skip lots of like installing and problems with installation. So you would just pull this Docker from, from uh, the GitHub um, and then run it. So I also, I mean, later you can give me feedback if you have read the readme page on GitHub. We always welcome feedback. You know, if something is not very understandable, if people would like more input on what is going on there, it's a live live page and we really want to uh, make it as user-friendly as possible. So today we are going to run it. Um, um, quick question. Git Sorry, just because you're going on to the running part. So a few questions on chat are, uh, I'll just read them out. Although people, please feel free to, Marcela is lovely. She always says, please interrupt me. So I, I realize that you all want me to interrupt her. Abdullah has his hand raised. I'll just ask the qu questions in chat and then it's all yours, Abdullah. Um, so the question was, uh, what do you polish with uh, when you said, if you have polished uh, Oxford Nanopore uh, assemblies? I wrote, Illumina, but it could be back bio as well, right? I mean, it could be anything. Il or it can be nanopore itself. There Na are multiple tools. nanopore. Yeah, but then you should, I mean, the, ideally you would have a good coverage of Illumina as well. Okay, that's one question. Uh, next question was, at what step of the genome assembly do you apply Mito Hi-Fi? Obviously you said reads and contexts, but is there one that's better? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I've never systematically tested, so it's for scientists to say it's difficult, right? But I have this hint like this, which is better to start with reads, I would say, okay. than with context. But I mean, to be honest, it varies, like, because sometimes the, I, I think I think will depend a lot on the age of your num. If you have very, uh, like, recent num insertions, they can be very similar to your mitochondria, and that might influence but at the same time, they would be fished in the in the read read fishing. In the parsing, so, in the parsing step, yeah. So, um, I mean, most of the time we use it starting from reads. I think we uh, it's um, it's a standard for us to output those ones. So I would give it a go if you have the resources to try with reads. Yeah. Um, next question. There's one one more after that. Um, if the mitochondria is circular, why does the coverage fall at the start and end of the plot? And I think you'll be covering that later, right? Uh, not necessarily, but it's okay. basically, um, I guess. I mean that. So you mean here? Yes. Well, well, basically, reads then map. So it, as it's circular, reads then map at the end, map at the beginning as well, right? So you mean. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, it's an artifact of mapping, no? It's an so artifact I guess... of mapping, yeah. So if if we had got two pieces of the genome next to each other, then the coverage even... would have been uniform. But because yeah. it's at the end, you're basically saying, because of the uh, the mapping is done to a linear contact to show coverage, uh, yeah. half of the read is not mapping. So when you get to that point, it's basically saying, well, I'm not mapping because half of it is not mapping. So that's the... Then yeah. you take out. Yeah, if then you had it, it two drops. coffees, you would have had a uniform coverage throughout the middle. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And one other question was, is there a Conda version? But you already answered that by saying there is not because the tools that Mito HiFi uses are Python 2 and Python 3, and you can't have both inside one Conda. So you have yeah, to so, use Docker or, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I would really recommend to use Docker. And then, but, but, there's a but. We have a Conda recipe for the most of the software. If you want to try this, then you just install everything, like most of it with Conda, and then you need to install MitoFinder and Mitos separately, and then put them in the path, and then link it to the, and then try to run. But I see lots of people having problem with it, and then they come, oh, it's not annotating, it's not finding a tRNA. It's basically because the annotation tool is not in the right path. So I would extremely recommend using the Docker container. That would be the best option. But if you need Conda, go to the GitHub and do the steps there. Abdul. Yeah. 
Hi, Marcela. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really nice tool. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. So the first one, so from my understanding from the pipeline, so it is not, it is reference based one. So it's not de novo. So these mean if I don't have like the reference uh, genomes, then it will not work. Yeah, it's not, it's not, well, it's not reference based because the assembly is de novo, but yes, the phishing of reads is reference based. So you, if you use this script that downloads a close related reference, um, you, it, it can be, I mean, if it's very far away from your species, it might be a problem, but you just use it to fish the reads and then we will do a de novo assembly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as a question, so because from my understanding, you already apply it into a wide range of organisms. So I'm, I'm wondering about the challenge. Sorry, your voice went away. Yeah, your voice went away. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about like the challenging with uh, single cell uh, eukaryotes because some of those organisms the report talk about uh, like fragmented or sometimes even uh, linear mitochondrial genome. So did you apply it to one of those organisms? Do you have this challenge? Yes. Yeah, so we do apply it, but it doesn't work in all of the cases. So there are other ways that you can find mitochondria as well. So depending on which organism, and if you think it will be like highly expressed in a tissue, you will see like you will need to assemble everything, then map all the reads back and you see separate contexts by coverage. Um, you can look for the main mitochondrial genes that you think are there because sometimes, this is a limitation of mitohyphi, sometimes uh, if it's like a kinid area or like a yeah, single cellular protest, it's very hard that you find a reference that is close because the genes that have all shift, right? shifted and they are like very different mitochondria uh, in the different, um, related species. So we, we cannot fish it with that uh, reference. So then, so then you need to use um, other tools or like other ways of identifying it. Yeah, it's a pain. Everton? Everton, sorry. Oh, okay. Thanks, Marcella, for the nice talk. I have like uh, two questions as well. The first one is like I was doing uh, high fi SM and high C data to get my genome and doing the phasing. And I completely forgot about to do the first step, like to assemble the mitochondria for my fungal genome. And I was, I was wondering, like, there was a, you, you said that you can do after using the countings or something like that. But do you think that's gonna, if we don't do this first step or removing the reads, our mitochondrial reads with the other steps, we're gonna have problems? to assembly or to get like chromosome level assembly problems in the high C and things like that? No, it's very unlikely that you are going to, so you have, do you have PacBio high fi Yes, okay. I have high fi high C and I just doing like a phase genome, but then I didn't do this my two high fi before. So yeah. it's kind of worry. So I... No, don't worry. So, I mean, we, so I did three of life and other, uh, consortia, uh, we um, assemble everything. So the thing arrives and we assemble everything. Why? Because, so the brilliance of PEC bio hi fi reads is that they are long enough to be unique and they have high quality. So the likelihood of you hybridizing things, making chimeras of like contamination or mitochondria with your nuclear genome is very, very low. Uh, the only problem like would be this that I mentioned, that like if you have like an, in, an insertion of a mitochondria that is very recent and you only have a read that is inside that num, mm -hmm. it could be like a mitochondrial read or a num read, but that is like an uh, uncertainty that we cannot uh, really untangle at the moment, you know, because it's okay. like the biology of the organism. So what I would do now for you is that you already have your phase assembly. So now take all of your contigs or scaffolds and run through mitohyphi. Okay. Because mitohyphi is going to help you identify which ones are mitochondria, and then you just remove them. So it's, you know, it's the likelihood of them interfering with the chromosomes is very rare. So okay. th that's what we do in our like contamination cleaning processes. We assemble everything, we scaffold everything, and then we uh, identify bacteria and, 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 and mitochondria and remove it from the assembly. Okay, thank you. Should I, should I keep going? Okay, good, good, good. 
Okay, so here is just a glimpse again, because we are going to do it and look at the things uh, by ourselves uh, as we run the pipeline. But just to show you, so this would be a typical output folder for MitoHiFi, okay? So you will have your final mitogenome.fasta there. Uh, here you can see it's 18 KB, so it's like a mitochondrial size. You're gonna have your final mitogenome.gb. And then you have the other uh, files. We will look at them together. So the context stats I told you, the shared genes I haven't mentioned yet, but I will soon. You have the annotation in PNG format, the context annotation, all the potential context. And then you have so different folders. We will look at the intermediate folders as well, because if things don't finish or either if they stop, you still have lots of intermediate outputs to go and invest in what was going on, okay? So the final mitogenome choice, for example, here, you will have a file like this, which is just basically all of the mitochondria that were assembled and then they were rotated to start at the phenylalanine tRNA and then they are aligned. So you, you can see why, what's going on. What, what are the differences between them? You know, go like, ah, maybe it's just like a read problem because it's a repeat or maybe it is a heteroplasmy because they have more than one mitochondria being expressed on my cell, right? So you can look at things like this. Another nice one is this coverage mapping here because you have burn files inside this folder and you can just basically open IGV and have a quick look at, of your mappings as well, okay? But we, I mean, we won't open IGV, but uh, I will show you this intermediate result as well. Right, I talk too much. Right, so uh, let's, let's do it. So I really need to thank uh, Sujay because he put our tool on Gitpod, which is amazing. It's basically this, so I think you are all familiar with already because he has been very good at communicating with you all. So you have this prepared. And basically we have the Docker container on Gitpod, which means that when we are going to be running the pipeline, all of the dependencies are there because it's our little universe and then everything should work. Okay, so let's assemble something pink. So let's start with, the, with this very beautiful moth. But now let's together go and uh, connect I should have done this before, Suj, but fine. Let's all open our Gitpod machines. Yay. Okay. Um, we have, where is it? Folder. No, don't read my email. Anymore. I will put the links in the Discord, uh, but yeah, you can find your link from email because I don't think you're on Discord. Yeah, where is it? Here. Okay. So, here. right. So, let's click on the to do here okay everyone so on the launch git pod workspace and then we click on thingy let's open it it's so hot in cambridge it shouldn't be that hot people let us know if you are where I am as well. Yeah, so what I was doing was I was giving people a minute and then saying, if you're not seeing, if you are seeing, that's great, put a thumbs up. But if you're not seeing what Marcella is seeing, then we can't see everybody's thumbs up or thumbs down easily because of the way the Zoom is set up. Just speak up and say, give me 10 seconds more or give me a minute more, okay? So everybody should click on the tutorial page and click on the bit where it says launch git pod and then you should see what marcella is seeing and if you're not seeing what marcella is seeing like i'm not seeing what marcella is seeing because i haven't clicked it yet <laughs> click here to launch a git pod workspace with mito hi fi right how is it uh, how uh, how is it it's it's people are people not here or are people here so what did you say switch that they should let us know if they're they not should, there no <laughs> <laughs> they should let you know if they are not seeing what you are seeing on the screen because we want everybody to be on the same page. And are they talking to you on Discord or here? Um, no? I want people to speak up. I don't want to be the only one translating from Discord, but yes. Is everybody okay? Uh -huh. Can we move ahead? Fermi is still creating the pulling ah, container. still creating. Even. Great. Yeah, give us... Sometimes uh, this is a good thing. Sometimes uh, Gitpod takes a few seconds to fire up a workspace. So other people might be very fast. Yours might be slow because Gitpod has a certain number of machines. And if the requests become more, they have to start a new machine to load your machine. 
So that's why they take a little longer, but usually within 30 seconds to a minute, everything should be done. So let me know when yours is done. It shouldn't take more than a minute, maximum. Let's just give everybody another 20 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. Because it's really nice to be able to run. I mean, I have been on many bioinformatics training workshops where even to get to this stage takes so long. And it's nice to be able to actually run the examples live and examine all the files on the left and see what the plots look like on top. It's just, I've had great fun with this. So yeah, I'm, so this was always good, Jay. He's great. Cause yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Gitpod because I saw it in another workshop. So I didn't I didn't come up with this idea. Other people did. Right. So should we go so, ahead? Is everybody okay? Sorry. Yeah, exactly. So we want to hear. Is some anyone not here? Okay, so sorry, sorry Marcella. Do, do I need to see uh, these folders because I'm 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 on Gitpo, uh, Gitpo, uh, but I don't see the I see just license. I don't see lecture examples, Mito Hi-Fi. I don't see these folders. Did you click on the link in the page for Mito Hi-Fi? Uh, yes, the one in the chat, the one in the Discord. Okay, let me try that again. No, sorry. Yeah. That I installed it in advance, uh, but uh, maybe yeah, yeah. But the, that the one that I sent you beforehand was only for testing and confirming. Testing it. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. if you now go to this Mito Hi-Fi page, there should be a. Can you just show it, Marcella, again on your Mito Hi-Fi page? It's uh, here, yeah. here. Yeah. So you should have a link that says "Click here to launch a Git pod." It's down at the bottom of the page. Okay. 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 Yeah, fine. Okay. Thanks. I will do that. That's awesome. great. Okay. So are you opening? Okay, that's good. So we can uh, just like start uh, talking a little bit. So we have this amazing page that Switch also worked on. Uh, and you have, yes, yeah, so the Git pod there to launch your instance. And here we have all the commands that we are going to run today. Okay, so it's all there. You can copy and paste. So CG is basically change directory, you know, and we have the path for the folder where we want to go, okay? So just to show you, the first one that we will assemble is this guy here, this something pink, uh, and you just need to go to the, the left Parcelus folder, okay? So let's do that. So we basically copy this command here, copy, and we go there on our command line, yay, which is like a normal command line. Can everyone see this? And then we are just going to basically and I think you need to allow it for the first time you do that. So it's passed it and I'm changing it there. See? So in Linux, um, in Linux, if you give this command called pwd, it shows you exactly where you are. And that's where we want to be. Carl, how is your machine? Fine, fine. Thanks. Okay. okay. Good. Right. So, okay. So I can show you this. Um, I would just, I just want to show you the GitHub as well, because then you get familiar with, with it later on, if you need it, um, which describes lots of things. Okay. And then if you go here, uh, how to run Mito High Fine, we'll tell you what to do uh, to get the reference. So the first, so just to show you that if you go to four, 4.1, you will find that also in the future. So the first thing that we want you to do is to find a reference for our run, okay? So we need to find a reference like a FASA and a, a gene bank file. So we have this script inside our pipeline called findMitoReference.py. And then the, the parameters for this script is the name of the species, which is dash dash species. And then you have the species in between quotation marks. Where you want to output it, we want to output it here. So in this folder, okay. And then what is the minimal length of a sequence that you want? Why we have that? Because there are in the databases, lots of mitos that are incomplete. And we want to, given the biology of our species, we want it to, to, to have a complete reference, no? So then we can use it, the genes to do the annotation later. So in this case, I want to find a close related mito for this moth, and I want it to be at least 14 um, mega, uh, K, KV in size, okay? So I will copy this command. Okay, before I copy this command, I will show you just what the script itself, okay? So if you come here and you, oh, 
you come here and you do, and you pass it there, and you do minus minus help, then it shows you what's going on. Like what are the parameters? What is the, what are the things that you need to run the script? Okay, so it's always helpful and useful to have a look at the readme of a script when you're using it. And now we are going to run it. So everyone, please, let's do it together. Quick question. Uh, somebody's asking, how do you decide on that 14,000? Biology. So I know that um, I know that my species is a moth and moth assemblies are uh, at least like 15,000. And then I think like mm, all the references I had there were Illumina. If there was some like repeat uh, in the past, they probably not assembled because they were short reads. So it's likely that something with 14 KB will have all the genes. It's just so you need to know a bit the biology. If you have a fungi and you know your fungi can be like 100,000 base pairs, then you need to have a minimum that is larger, you know? So, so you need in to- in this case, to be on the safe side, you could also put 12,000 or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you could, yeah, then you might have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, you could. I mean, you, you might you might have an incomplete one, but it's still it's maybe enough yes. to fish the reads, you know. So we are going to run MitoHiFi with the default annotation, which is MitoFinder. Okay, and MitoFinder will use the genes annotated in your reference to do its own annotation because it's going to take those genes, going to blast it against your sequence. If you are using mitos, which is the other option for annotation, so you go dash dash mitos. Mitos has its own database. So um, it's not using the reference. So even then in this case, if you have a, if you know that the only reference you have for your species is something incomplete on the databases, I would advise to annotate it with mitos because then mitos is not going to use that sequence as a reference. It's only going to use it as a reference to fish reads. Okay, so let's do it. Ta -da! So now it's looking for a mitochondria for, for that species. Okay, and now it has output it there. So, Output of this sequence, FASTA and gene bank. And then if we do LS minus LTRH or LS, we find that the, the reference is there. Okay. Leah. You hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. No, I was pointing out in the chat that uh, recently we tried to do the sound. And when I tried to do that, I um, Dude, I cannot. I cannot sorry, hear you. My bad. Well. My bad. I uh, I made the mistake because I said please ask uh, Marcella, and I forgot that you had written that your mic had a problem. Uh, I'll read out the question. Sorry, Leah. Um, uh, just to let you know, I tried Mito HiFi recently, and I, when I put the minimum length in the command, it downloaded the Mito genome from the wrong species. Uh, it was a Thaliana, and I put the length of the uh, official Mito genome from Arabidopsis. Then I tried without the minimum length and it worked. Yeah, so we will, yeah, so it will be funny like that, I think. Uh, do you mean, so, I mean, I mean, depending on the minimum that you put, uh, it's going to look through the taxonomy and it's going to choose something. That support, I mean, it, it may vary, but it should be a plant <laughs> and it should be similar to what you're looking for, okay? Uh, if you find a bug that is like, oh, it's, Downloading something completely different. Send me later because I want to have a look as well. Okay, but but of course, depending on your minimum, is going to be slightly different. What you're going to get, uh, hopefully, close enough that you will be able to run Mito HiFi anyway and and get your mitochondria. So is everyone here? Everyone has a reference, so we can basically have a look at the at the gene bank, for example. Have a look. Nah, 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 nah. Is it there? What is this? Da, da, da. We see it's an insect, it's a lepidopter, nice. Okay, in this case, it's like a species that is as a congenera, congenera species, no, of the one that we want to assemble. Okay, so it's there, we know it's like 15 KB, cool, it's circular, nice. Right, so now I have what I need to run Mito HiFi because I already have in my folder 100 reads from the species that, uh, that I wanna sequence and I wanna get the mitochondria out, okay? So we have our reads there. So basically we can have a look. Um, we can have a look at our reads if we want. Copy. So we have our reads IDs, so it's all there. So, so fine. So now we will run MitoHiFi because we already run the first command. 
So now we will copy this other command. Again, it's good practice to first have a look at the readme if we can. So we're just gonna run the main script there. So you go mito hi-fi minus minus help, for example. And it will show you all the help message, okay? So what are the required arguments? What are the optional ones? And I will go through them with you now. So basically, uh, where's my slide here? I think here is better than in the slide. So basically I'm giving, I'm asking the pipeline to run in the reads mode, minus R, because I have my reads there, okay? And then I'm giving the reference I'm using, which is minus F and minus G. So I'm going to give the FASA sequence and the G, G bank uh, sequence for that reference. Then I'm saying I'm wanna, I wanna run it with one thread. You can run it with more threads, depending on where you are. And then we have this parameter called minus O, and this is important. So this is basically the mitochondrial code uh, of the species that you are running. If you don't know, you can go to NCBI taxonomy and we will find what is the mitochondrial code for your species, okay? Here, we also have like a, um, a small a synthesis of the different codes, but I always um, advise you to have a look at on NCBI. If you put a wrong code, by the time that you are predicting doing the annotation, it's going to use the wrong code and then you're gonna, might have lots of frame shifts or you might not be able to annotate your genes. So it's important that you use the correct code. Okay, so the standard code, the vertebrate mitochondrial code, and then you see the standard one would be one, the vertebrate mitochondria would be two and so on, okay? So in our case, we are assembling an insect. So we are using uh, five, okay? Which is the invertebrate mitochondrial code. Good, so let's do that. Let's copy our command and run it. Now it's running. Let's run it, everyone. Times go much faster than I <laughs> than I expect. Anyone having a problem? Is everyone here in the same step as us? Yeah, while it's running, uh, for people who it's running for, that's great. People who it's not running for, please just unmute yourself and ask. Yes, please. So useful things that I can already show you. The pipeline shows some log, shows welcome to the, to the pipeline. Um, what is the reference that you are using? You are running on the reads mode, so, which means it's running my uh, mini map two to map your reads, okay? And then it shows you that you don't want any secondary alignments and so on. So it uses basically the reference uh, and then your reads. So mapping your reads to the reference and then it does all the filtering. Um, it, so then, after, sorry, and then it does high fiasm to assemble your reads. After high fiasm, it does the filtering. In the filtering requires BLAST. So it makes a BLAST database of your uh, reference, and then it runs BLAST, and then it does the parsing of the, of the sequence. So basically, um, so, well, I will show you when we have the results. But basically, you took your reads, you map to your reference to, to filter them. Then you only have mitochondria reads, hopefully, in some numbers, which is fine, it happens. Then you assemble them. After you assemble them, you blast it against the reference again, and then you do the filtering. One of the filterings that we have is this minimum query percentage here, uh, which is 50%, which means I basically parse out the blast output. I look if the sequence of my contig is at least 50% contained in the blast search against my reference. So, because I want, I don't want a very large num, which only has like a piece of a mitochondrial gene to be as one of the selected contigs. So I want that my contig is mainly a mitochondria. And this parameter, this percentage of 50, it, it, it will vary a lot on depending on which clade you are working on. Okay, like Kinidaya, for example, I always use it as, as a, and as an example, because uh, the, the genes are all shift, shifted, like depending on the reference that you're using, it's not very conserved at all. Then this minus P parameter needs to be smaller. So you allow your pipeline to fish contigs that have 
less of its length in the blast match with the reference because they can still be uh, the, the mitochondria. Okay, so now, whoop. yay, finished. Okay, so now the pipeline has finished. Um, and I will show you the results now. So I guess you started like a few seconds after me. So your will finish very soon, but just have a look here with me at my results, okay? So here we are. So we had at the beginning, we had those three things there, which is the reads and the gene bank file and the FASTA file. And now we have our results. So we have, so the pipeline finished, we have the final mitogenome.fasta sequence there, and we have the annotation. So I will show you, uh, I will show them. For example, this is the gene bank file. So it's a contig, which is 15, uh, 15 KB, 316 base pairs. And then we have all the locations of the CRNAs and we have the genes predicted and so on. So we use MitoFinder to do this prediction. We go step by step here. Let's look at this. So one of the, so it's, so, I mean, you will finish and you say, ah, it's an insect mitochondria. So it's 16 KB, you go like, so far, so good. I think I have a mitochondria. And then you go, okay, context stuff. Uh, I wanna have a look at the statistics of my run. So you go and look at this file, okay? And this is this. So is that table that I showed you that is in the paper. So basically our related mito is 15 KB and it has 37 genes. And then in this run, we only have one contig uh, assembled because you know it's a small, uh, it was small, a small data set. It has no frame shift. This is the name of it. And it is 15 KB in size, 316 bases, has 36 genes, and it was circularized. So we found the points of any removed the redundancy. And you go like, oh, nice. That seems like a nice mitochondria, you no? Know? And then like one gene less, it's not, I mean, the gene can also be a tRNA and we know that tRNA is a variable. And sometimes it's also only an annotation problem. So annotation is another problem, okay? So we have an annotation here to check the sanity of the mitochondria, but you need to check your annotation after. But if you're curious, you try to see which gene is missing uh, in your reference, then you go into this shared genes here. I will try to improve this output. It's not the most beautiful thing, it's like a Python dictionary, but it's, it, it already, it's already somehow useful, okay? So basically you have this, so you have different uh, columns in this table and you have your, uh, your final, like your final mitogenome in this line. And, and then you have this like brackets thing showing what is shared between the related reference and your sequence and what is unique to each one of them, okay? So basically ATP6 is fine, found in both, it's shared. Co COX1 is found in both, COX2 is found in both, and you see what is found in both in here, okay? So what is not found uh, in our, um, what is unique to our contig, we can see here is ATP8. So basically ATP8 gene was not annotated, okay? So ATP8 was not annotated and it's only present in the related mitochondria, see? And this is classic, right? ATP8 is a very variable mitochondrial gene and it's difficult to annotate. You can have it pseudogenized or you cannot have it at all or you can, or it's difficult to annotate. So that's like, this really shows like the sanity of your um, mitochondria. It's well assembled, it's there. Uh, and you just don't have that gene annotated. Cool. So with this one, I want to only show you this main outputs and then we can have a look at the figures. Okay. So basically uh, we have here, we can have a look at the plots that create that it creates, for example, here. So we have the coverage plot there and we have the annotation plot as well. See, kind, kind, kind of cool. So good. That's great. That's a well, nice uh, finished run. So let's go to the second example. And then on this example, I will show you a little bit more uh, on the intermediate folders as well. Quick question. Before, um, mm. Let's say that I already, from somebody on the chat, let's say that I already have a mito genome assembly, but it is not annotated. Could I use the mito hi fi to do the annotation? 100%. Yes. So you just do the fine mito reference. Uh, all the same, and then you run it in the minus C mode. Uh, and then if you want, you can use minus minus mito. So you can have two annotations if you like. You can have mito finder annotation and the mitos annotation. So you can use it to do that. Yeah. 
So just to clarify, you're saying use the minus C mode, but with only the one contig. Yeah, because that would be quicker, no? Yeah, exactly. Cool, got it. Yeah, okay. Right, so I mean, so let's look, only look at this um, folder here because this is the only time we, we run it in this class with the reads mode. So if you, as we run it with minus R, let's go to this intermediate folder here that's called reads mapping and assembly. Is that what I want? No, that's not what I want to show. I want to show the coverage. Sorry. So we want to go to coverage mapping folder. OK, so look, we have files as outputs, figures, and folders. So it's all organized there for you to inspect what's going on. So if we go to the coverage mapping, then you have uh, different BUM files. So basically, you would need. So in this case, you only assembled one config, right? So these files will be the same. Um, but for example, we have cases where we have lots of heteroplasmy, or we have different mitos being created because you have because mitochondria has like a high coverage of reads, and then the probability of uh, having errors in the reads is higher because you have high coverage. And then software just basically outputs different contexts. So that's also it's an artifact of assembly having very high coverage. So basically, this uh, file here, uh, or the sorted one, would be all of the potential contexts, all the reads map back to all of them. OK? And then we, you can inspect which read is being drawn to each specific contig on IGZ. For this one will be all the reads map only to the final assembly. So then you have all of the mito reads. You can all even study your heteroplasmy by looking then at the coverage. Okay, so it's all there for you guys. It's really nice uh, in the sense. So you can use these bun files together with with the files that are here, which is the all potential contexts. You just create an index for it, and then you open on IgG or the final mito genome, which also has the bun file with all the reads mapped to it. Cool. So now let's assemble a bird, which is this guy. So now we are going to go to assemble a bird. Any questions? Is everything OK? Cool. Good, good. Right, so let's do I, it. I have a, I have a silly question. Um, when you said you provide the reads mapped back to the potential context, obviously, in this case, there was only one potential context. But let's say you mm -hmm. had 10 potential contigs. Would it map all the reads to contig one and then all the reads to contig two and then all the reads to contig three, or would it distribute them? It would no. So all of them. For the all contigs, you will distribute. Got it. So then and that's for, a good way of checking. Yeah. And for the final contig, it will be all the reads against the final. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so let's look at our bird. So we can go to our website for commands. Uh, where is it? Here. So let's change directory to the Signus Colombianus. Colombianus. Copy. Change directory, CD. There. There. Too many arguments. Just need one. Yee Right. So ignore this, but we have our context there. So first thing, I know which bird I want to uh, assemble. And I, I know that also it's like a typical mitochondria. So then I will give 14,000 again, OK, as my, as my minimum length. And I give, I give my species name to the mitofinder reference. And then we go and download it. So let's do it. Looking for it. Done. It's downloaded. So we have our reference there. So let's have a look, check the vanity of it. Na, na, na. Cool. It's an A's. Good. That's what we need. It's actually the species. So that's also nice. So we can compare with the, we, we can compare with someone else that has already done a reference how our assembly is going to be. Right. For this case, I have context. Okay which I need to start my pipeline with 
minus C. Is this clear? I hope that's clear. If you know people don't understand, let us know. But here, show you. So it's high chiasms. It, it could be high canoe. It could be anything else that you use to assemble your reed. And I have, see, I have contigs. The P contig up there, see? Right, so then we take our command. Our command will be mito high fi minus C, my contig, minus F, my reference, minus G, my reference in gene bank format, minus O, which is my code. So in this case, it is vertebrate. Eh? What is the minus two again? Is the vertebrate mitochondrial code? Yeah. So minus two, and then I can give three cores if I want, three threads. So let's do that. So let's copy this and do it. Running it. Uh, sorry, I have a question while it's running. Yes. Hello. Uh, Hello. So for this, uh, hi. Uh, so for the, starting for the context, you would put in the context that you already know are mitochondrial, or do you just put all the context uh, and let Mito Hi Fi do the searching for you? Put all the context, uh, the context, because it's not costly, it's just a blast with the reference. Uh, yeah. So, you know, okay. you just put it, and it also helps you to find them. So we will have a look at the, we can have a look at the parsing outputs now, intermediate outputs, and it, it's, it's actually nice, you know, you can see if you have NEMS there or not, so. Okay, thank you. Is, is, some, is anyone, anyone lost? Everyone okay? <laughs> I, I have a quick question whilst it's running, if that's all right. Of course. And um, in the previous one, it said something on the output on the standard out uh, about that it was checking for reads that were longer than the reference mitochondrial genome, um, and then uh, suggesting that they were numps. So are numps typically very big? Yeah, so numps will be very big, but if you are um, if you are mapping a read, um let's say you have a because this is filtering out your let me think let me think when we map the reads we feel we fish all of them we just don't take secondary alignments fine then we do the assembly right the parameter that we put there oh no during okay during the reads filtering there is a parameter, thanks for reminding me this. There is a parameter which is to remove reads that are larger than the mitochondria, okay? The reference. So if you consider that the reference is complete, which is tricky because mitochondria might have repeats that were not resolved there, but if you consider that the mitochondria is complete and you have a read that is larger than your reference, it's likely that you have a piece of a nuclear sequence in that read as well, you know? So that's why we remove it. Right, okay. Now, so what's attached to the end of it? That's what it's worried about. Yeah. Now, but I can tell you, in research with Hymenoptera, we see that lots of Hymenoptera mitochondria that are out there are missing repeats. And we see repeats, systematic repeats being present um, on the mitochondria. So you can change this parameter because sometimes you remove real uh, mitochondrial reads because you think they are numps, but they are just like they have the repeat that the reference doesn't have. So we, you can change this parameter to not filter these reads out. So I will show you, so it's good that you asked this. I will open here another terminal just to show you what is the, par what is the um, parameter. So you have if to type bash do... first. Ah, thanks. <laughs> if you're opening a new terminal, you have to type bash first. So if you think that you have a, a if you think you have an incomplete mitochondria reference and you might have reads that have repeat, they are mitochondria, you should use this parameter called max max read length. Then you can give it and you say 1.5, that you say, I want to keep reads that are 
at like one time and a half the size of the reference. See where I want to keep them for my for my for the assembly or two times the reference. So right now the default is one. So if the read is going to be larger than the reference, it's going to be discarded. But if you want to keep larger reads, you can use this also in your uh, when you are running Mito HiFi. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, good. I've got a follow on question. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, um, that's all right. So I, I'm not too um, familiar with how um, hi fi sequencing works, but is it possible? Uh, it's on the same subject, but you'll get hi fi reads which just keep on uh, going around the mitochondrial circle. So they'll be like, because, like, you know, you might have a, a 20 kb read and your mitochondria might be 10 kb could it have gone around two or three times maybe and you're emitting, yeah and you're emitting you know good data is, is that a possibility is that how hi-fi sequencing works will it will it yeah, so, around one one circular genome keep on sequencing i mean if she does that it's more like an artifact than a good thing because ideally if you go, so you will go around many times, like here, right? So you will go around, let's say this is a mitochondria, you go around many times. But then as soon as you process and you create the CCS reads, which is the high fi reads, the pipeline needs to identify the harping adapters, remove them, and then make the consensus out of it. All right, yeah, yeah. So if you have a concat catamer with adapters in the middle that's not useful usually for assembly because it's something gone wrong with your sequencing you know so you should you shouldn't trust those reads anyway okay right okay right good so we finished okay so has has your run finished as well everyone cool okay so let's have a look at the results that we have here for our birds Right, so I want to have a look. So I like in a glimpse, I look, okay, so I have a 17 KB final faster. That's nice. But I want to have a look at my contig stuff. Huh, so what do I have here? Let's see. So I have my related mind was 16 KB, 37 genes. And I have something that is also 16 KB in 37 genes, and it was circular. That's really nice. And then I have another contig as well, which means in my pile of contigs, like my pile with contigs, I had two mitochondria. You know, they are slightly different, as you can see. One has like a few bases less than the other. Interesting. So with this, we can have a look at uh, intermediate outputs. So let's have a look at the contigs filtering folder, okay? Oh, sorry. So here I have um, the, uh, the intermediate outputs for the BLAST. This is a BLAST output six format. You can have a look at what each column represents. And then I also output two extra columns, which is the size of the contig and the size of the reference, okay? Because with that, I wanna do my parsing. So then I basically have the parse outputs uh, that we can have a look at fast. And then I can explain to you what this means. So basically here I have a column table and it has the name of the, the name of my contig and what happened to it in relation to the blast. So basically like this, I do, as I told you, we blast the assemble contig against the reference. And then I do a very rough estimation of the length of the query covered in the blast. So in this case, this contig here is 100% inside the blast match, which means bases, like most of the bases are in this blast match, okay? And then it shows me what is the size of my query. So it's 28 KB. And then the size of my subject, which is the reference is 16 KB. And then uh, the percentage of, uh, is it again? So the, this, uh, 
so the seven so this so basically like this is rough as well so it's like how much ugh. so i don't want to lie so let's read it here because i have it here da -da -da. so the length of the query is 170 times the length of the subject which is the which is my um reference sequence right yeah, one so point, basically 1.7 times yeah yeah so so basically because it's larger right yeah. so basically and then like later on this is going to be removed so this is just the first parsing right so these two look good and these two are the ones that appear in our output in the context stats folder then i want to show you how the pipeline has filtered out something else there was one more context there which was this context here and then if you figure out why because it blasted against the reference but only four percent of of it was in a blast match so the probability here is very high that this is a num like it's a num that has a gene that blasts with the reference but it's not the entire sequence it's not the it's not the mitochondria okay and then we have other evidences of that like for example the fact that it's a much larger not very large but a larger contig than the other contig so the likelihood of this being an empty is very high so this is also nice in this if you have like a whole genome assembled and you have this list here you can already see where your potential numps are so then you can go later and investigate them okay so this is the output that i would like to show you for this um for this run questions Okay, so uh, somebody yeah. asked on chat, could this be exactly what you said? I think could this be a transferred section from the mito to the nuclear genome? Yeah, that's yeah. what's uh, numped. What does numped stand for? I always get confused. Nuclear, nuclear mitochondrial insertion. Elisa, yeah, Elisa yeah. probably knows better than me. I don't know. Yeah, no, <laughs> nuclear N U M T. Nuclear mito. What's the T? Maybe insertion is like. Let let me Google it for you. So should yeah, you Google? Thank you. <laughs> right. I know it's so, NUMT, but I never know what it stands for. It, the T is transfer. Yes, and I, I never thought about the T too with <laughs> nuclear <laughs> mitochondria or something. Maybe just nuclear mitochondria. <laughs> yeah, I mean someone Google it quickly, we will see. Right. So for this, sorry. I'm sorry, I think it's just nuclear mitochondrial DNA, but then the DNA is cut out. So it's just the NU for nuclear and MT for mitochondria. Right, so for this output, if we, so if when we run it with minus C as we did, then we don't have a coverage plot, okay? Because there is no reads to map because we started with counting. Uh, if we do have a look at the, uh, of the folder that is created anyway, it will be empty. Okay, so I'll just show you. There is nothing there. Um, but you still have the annotation file, so we can go and have a look. We go to the do here. So see, we have two, right? If we look at our context stats, we have two candidates, and then we have the annotation of both in this file. And you have the annotation of the final one, just one in this file. So it's all there for you. Uh, nice. So now, good. So now I want to show you the last example, and then we can talk about Wait, when so the how pipeline. How do we decide which one is better? Well, the pipeline decides for you. Okay. But you can look at the other one to see if you agree or not. 100%. And you can do this. Uh, you can go. Um, you can go, for example, here, final mito choice. And you have the aligned sequence, no? So you do have, you go like, mm, yeah. basically the same. What do they have different? I think it's fine, you know, kind of thing. So you can do that. <laughs> So it's all these intermediate files out there for you guys. It's like, it's nice to have them because it really helps with infection, you know? Uh, 
And I mean, in the, in the paper, we do describe what is the criteria that we use to, to choose the like complete number of genes or very close to complete number of genes, very close to the size of the reference, if it's true or not in, in terms of being circular. So you will, we'll try to have all this criteria there if possible when we are assembling it. Right, so let's do, uh, let's do a bryophyte. Ta-da, a plant, okay? So we are going to do this guy now. So we can go back to our command and change there. Oh, too many arguments. Is everyone there? Okay, for this one, we also have contig, and this is a plant. So our cells are much larger than before, okay? Because plant mitochondria can be crazy, which, which means that for this guy, we are going to put it running, but we are not gonna wait because it takes 20 minutes. We are going to then go into the results folder and have a look uh, at the results that are already there, okay? But the... Um, what I want to show is that the commands are the same for plants. You're just going to give the species name. And the thing here is the size, right? Because you need to know a little bit of the biology of your plant to, to know what is the approximate mitochondrial genome size. And I know that we don't know, and we are here to find out. So we need to try different cutoffs and, you know, to like uh, try and see which reference is best. So you can run this multiple times, you know. You can also run with minus two. So it will give you two different references. For example, I will give this. So I'm trying to find the mitochondria for this. I'm outputting it here. My minimal length in this case is 50 KB. And I want you, I wanted to download two close references, okay? So we can do that. Good, so we have downloaded two, see? So we will have four files in our folder. Okay, so another thing, another thing. Let's again, just run our my, my reference dot pi minus minus, oops, sorry. Minus minus help. This can download chloroplast as well. Okay, so if you are trying to assemble a chloroplast, you can download a chloroplast. And then we would just do this minus minus type. Chloro, the default is a mitochondria, so you can get a chloroplast. Looking for chloroplast, see? Cool, chloroplast downloaded. So we have two chloroplasts and two mitochondria. We are going to run mitochondria anyway, and we are going to run it in the C mode as well. So easy. So we're just gonna copy our command, which is mitohi-fi minus C, our context from Haikanu this time, and minus F, our faster reference, minus G, our gene bank. We will give six threads. Our code is standard code, and minus A plant. So you need this parameter when you are assembling plants. Why? Because one of the filterings uh, for animal uh, mitochondria is to remove contigs that are five times larger than the reference. The thing is that with plants, uh, mitochondria can be crazy very in size. So we don't want to remove anything. So we just keep lots of different contigs of different sizes there uh, after our parsing, okay? So if you are running with a plant, you need to use minus A plant. That said, so let's put it to run, okay? So we are running and already annotating with MitoFinder. Right, so now you open a new a new tab, so you can come here in this, here, so we open a new tab, see, and then you you write bash, oops, sorry, bash, and you are on your workspace, 
And then we will move again to the Climastium dendroides folder. And then we go to results, okay? And here we have our results for this render is going to take, um, it's going to take 20 minutes. So I want to show you what happens with plants. Plants are harder, okay? And we have another tool that I will mention common today uh, for plants. But mitohyphi can deal with some plants. In this case, it, it, it is able to get a complete mitochondrial genome for this species. So that's why I chose this. But let's have a look. So if we look at the final FASTA sequence, you go like, mm, it's 105 KB. Ooh, that's a very large FASTA, isn't it? And um, I don't have the reference here, but let's look at the reference that we are using, which is this one. So it is also large, so mm, interesting. So we have a final FASTA that is 105, and our reference is like similar size. So that's so far so good. So it seems like I have a complete mitochondria as well, or at least the same size as my reference. Um, okay, then I wanna look at my context stats uh, output, okay? Because I wanna know what happened there. So I see that my rel related mito is 104 KB in size and it has 67 genes. Then my final mito, uh, has one frame shift in a gene. That's the first thing that we see. It's an A and NAD5 in G5. Uh, it is very similar size, length as the reference, and it has a very good number of genes as well. And it was circularized. So this is really cool. You say like, oh, I, I do think I have a complete mitochondria here, right? Which is nice. Then you look at the other context. So this is something that if you're trying to assemble a plant, organelle, it will probably happen, which is that you're going to have fragments of your organelle in other contexts as well. Because depending on the amount of repeats that you have on the plant organelle, it, it won't, the assemblers won't assemble it entirely, completely together, right? So it's very typical that you will see things like this. We have one contig that also has a frame shift, has this gene as well, and it's like 55 KB, sorry, 25 KB in size, and it has 18 genes. And it's not circularized. So very likely to be a piece of your mitochondria, not your complete mitochondria. And so on and so on. And then you have another one that is um, 43 in size. And this one has no frame shift, but who tells me that I have the ND5 there? It, it can be another piece, okay? So this is something that happens a lot when people do plants, chloroplasts or uh, mitochondria, because these organelles are more complex. So people, you know, use MitoHiFi to do that and they write me and they say, oh, I have an incomplete sequence. And yes, the best that MitoHiFi can do is that for some mitochondria, you'll be able to assemble a complete sequence. But for some of them, uh, it will help you to identify your contigs and to annotate them. And you would need to take further action to be able to assemble them later. And then why? Right? Because of this. So basically, uh, here you see two graph structures for different organelles of plants, okay? So this is a chloroplast and this is a mitochondria. So if you're not very used to see graph structures of sequences, bear with me and now we will explain to you what this is showing, okay? So here we have, so from this graph, uh, we output a fast sequence. We are very used to use linear sequences, right? But this is, a, this is a graph of a mitochondria from a plant, okay? All the sequences that are like colored, like green or blue and uh, pink here, they are a like a single copy sequence of DNA, okay? And then it encounters another sequence here, like this U47 here. And this is a shared sequence or a shared path in this graph that would create the sequence. So basically you have the U, which is green, and then you would find this repeat. And then this repeat is shared with these other sequences as well, okay? Which really means that when the assembler needs to decide what is the path that it's gonna take to create a linear sequence, it doesn't know where to go. So you could go like, you could go purple, this repeat and then purple, or you could go purple, repeat and green, green, pink, purple, green, 
uh, uh, pink and green again, which really means that we have a structure that is not linear per se in the cell. So we have multiple different versions of a mitochondria, okay? So um, this makes assemblers confused and then it, they usually breaks on the repeat. So what you have is that you don't have the complete sequence assembled by high phasm. You're gonna have the green and the blue and the, and the pink. And that's why when you see in mito high fi list, you're gonna have lots of different pieces. There are these different parts. Considering this, and th this is a chloroplast, okay? So very quickly as well, uh, this would be, so chloroplasts, I don't know uh, how um, familiar you are with chloroplasts, but chloroplast has two sequences that are single copy with genes and a inverted repeat in the middle, okay? And this is how we see this in here. So we have a single copy here. It has also some repeats there, but we have, let's disregard the repeats. We have a single path here. Then we have a repeat, and then we have another single sequence there, and then we go back to this inverted repeat. And then this is how it shows in a graph structure, okay? If you would unentangle it, you would have the two inverted repeats there. This is also very hard for normal assemblers to deal with. So then Chenji, our amazing uh, colleague has developed this pipeline further, a new pipeline to deal with plant organelles. So I really advise you to have a look at it because it uses another um, assembly algorithm strategy to try to resol resolve this as best as possible. It uses like very large case also to try to span repeats and then make the graphs less complicated. So I would really uh, advise you to go and use that if you, you know, if you run Mito HiFi and your for your plan, and then all, everything stops and you don't have your uh, 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 complete context there, it's very likely you have a very complex structure that will need something else uh, for assembly. Okay, so yeah, that's it. I think. Uh, how are we doing with our run? Well, I think I showed you what I wanted to show you for the plan here as well. So we have half an hour. So question, question so far. So I said I would ask uh, Leah's question. Uh, where is it? Can you eventually give the two references together to the command? Because you downloaded two references. Does the command take two references, the actual? No, got it. No, no, it's a limitation. <laughs> it doesn't, no. You need to give. One at a time. So if, if it doesn't work with one, uh, then you try the other one, or you have to have two independent runs to run it. Yeah. More questions? I think Dorita again asked, is it better to start from reads? Yes. In the Which, case of plants as well. Mm -hmm, in the case of plants. And... Um, uh, well... <laughs> you in the in the case of plants, I would use OTK. <laughs> <laughs> did did you try different assemblers? I saw that you used a uh, context generated by Kano. Did you try different assemblers and see whether you get the the same mitochondrial sequences or no? Which assembler? Sorry. I saw that you started with context generated by Kano. Yeah, so we usually high Kano or high Phasm usually. Uh -huh. Would you generate the same mitochondrial sequence if you start with different um, assemblies generated by different assemblers? Well, you hope you do. Hopefully you do. Now, it depends. So if, if it's a... If it, so it depends also how the algorithm was written because some assemblers don't deal well with very high coverage. So it will depend a lot of, on a lot of things. So sometimes you, um, if you have a lot of mitochondria reads expressed, then again, the likelihood of you having an error piling up and not really a heteroplasm is high, then you, some assemblers will get, some assemblers would even not assemble that. They would say, this is like a very, or a contamination or a very high coverage repeat and I'm not gonna assemble it. And they just don't assemble the mitochondria. So it depends. Some assemblers are prone to assemble things with different coverage. Those are usually metagenome assembly, assemblers. And if you have like a contaminated sample, sample that you might have a bacteria or also mitochondria for another species of symbiome, I really advise you to try assemblers that use uh, this different in coverage 
thing because you might get better assemblies uh, out of this because your mitochondrias will have like a different coverage in your nuclear reads. High Piazm and High Canoe usually work pretty similar. So they should output the same uh, mitochondria for you if you only have one mitochondria in your, in your sample. Thanks. My dog got tired one and a half hour, uh, three and a half hours stuck in the room. <laughs> <laughs> right. So finally, then, uh, if we if we don't have more questions, I want to show you this. Um, that it's like this is a big uh, error problem that pipeline stops and people ask me, which is this here. Okay. So the pipeline will stop like this. Part plus output file is empty, or the files are empty. So usually, so this means this can mean a lot of things. So this part output is basically what? So you took out your reads, you fished, you fished your mitochondria reads uh, mapping to your reference, then you have these reads, you assemble them, and then you blast against your reference. This means if this file is empty, it means nothing blasted. But then it can be several different steps, okay? You will need to look at the intermediate files because it can be that, first of all, nothing mapped. So this is the first thing that you need to see. Is this because nothing mapped and then nothing got assembled? Or is it because I got something assembled, but then when I blast it, it doesn't blast, right? So it can be these two steps. So if it is not so if it's not mapped, if you have reads that are not mapping to your reference, it can be two things. You don't have mitochondria reads. So sometimes you sequence like blood or you sequence something that is very poor in mitochondria, and then you just don't have mitochondria reads. The other reason for you not to have mitochondria reads is to like select the size, like very large sizes. Because I know we are obsessed about getting uh, very large reads for our nuclear assemblies, but then sometimes we throw off the mitochondria because the mitochondria will be 16 kb, so that's bad. So sometimes you just don't have it. They read there, so it can be that. But not mapping can also be the artifact, the problem of the reference, no? Because you have like a very distant related reference that you are not being able to uh, map to. So then I would suggest to run the find mito reference with minus n three or four, get different references, and then try to fish out reads with different references. So you might be able to fish your mitochondria reads there. Um, yes, so, so that's it, uh, really. So this was all I had to say. Um, and I want to know what your concerns, if you have more questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so I don't know if it happens also with animals, but sometimes with plants, in your reference, you will have more than one sequence for the mitochondria. Mm. Uh, so does uh, mito hi fi handle this well or not? It does. So the reference mm -hmm. should be a single, uh, single yeah. sequence. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So that's another limitation. Yeah. I would. I mean, I would really advise looking into OTK. It's. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But just as a as a question. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Matt? Yes, um, let's see. I know that you're getting the annotations from MitoFinder. Um, what are, does your script also add some, um, I don't know, checks to the those annotations or some logic for checking those? I mean, I know you're looking for frame shift, shifts, identifying those or like are the kind of, is that annotation that we see in the picture uh, on the screen right now, you know, pretty much what came out of MitoFinder. It's exactly. what came out of MitoFinder. So you need to, yeah, we would need to reference MitoFinder to see how they annotate, uh, which is, um, it, it's blast basically, no? So it's a MitoFinder annotation. Um, the only thing that we screen for, so we basically, so the annotation is not for us to submit, you know, the annotation for Mito hi fi is to check the sanity of the contig that we are assembling. So just to, to you know, be sure that you have the right contig. So while the script, what we do is check for the frame shifts. 
And ch checking the frame shifts is just basically checking if there is an asterisk inside of the, pr the predicted uh, protein sequence. So you also need to check the coordinates of your annotation later to see if it, uh, it's a nice annotation. And then mitos is going to, if you annotate with mitos, it's going to output a different annotation as well, right, in a GSS file. So annotation will be as good as what comes out of Mito Finder or Mitos. Um, yeah. There's a question coming up on chat. Mm -hmm. You can also unmute yourself and say it aloud. Ah. Could you share the link for Ot K? O oh yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because I I will do that. It will take me half an hour, but I will find it. <laughs> I'm just gonna because search. there is search for it because there is more than one chain G, and then I always get the wrong one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that the easiest way is just to look for yeah, as I found it. So. Yeah, if you just search for Oat K Chenchi, you don't find it. I know. So, oh, I, okay. So only you can send it to. Yeah, so I will put it in, you just in put Slack it in, for you. Yeah, put it in Slack and I'll put it here. Sorry. I, I should have given you permission at least. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Maybe using the name of the author. Um, I don't, that's I don't what know. we did. <laughs> it has been published. Yes, I know it has been published. Yeah. Okay. Ah, no, it hasn't you. been published yet. So, yeah. GitHub.com slash seed show. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, thank you. Yes. So, so it, yeah, I'm just showing you the GitHub. So, basically, it's a C code. So, it's also very easy to compile. It's good. Um, and you need this like databases because it does like a Hummer search. Uh, have a look here. And, but you just basically run OTK, the, the K mer size that you want for your. Uh, assembly and, and so on and so on. It's all on GitHub. I'll uh, be able to, to have a look. It doesn't give you an annotation though. So then I would suggest to come to Mito High Find and annotate your <laughs> chloroplast or your mitochondria, if you like. I mean, using yeah, using Mito, Mito Finder, I would use because Mitos is for, for animals mainly, the database they have. Um, just for anybody who's interested, I did reach out to Chen Shi, but I think he's very busy with uh, stuff. So I did ask if he would do a uh, workshop for BGA twenty three, uh, maybe next year or maybe next year. year. You you will all find out about it if you tick the box that says please keep me informed about other biodiversity genomics academy things. Oh, later in the year, huh? Well, at one point <laughs> we had thought that if there's enough demand, which there seems to be, and if there are enough people offering sessions, which there seems to be, then you know maybe this could be a continuous thing. Um, so we don't know. But right now it's happening just for the Biodiversity Genomics Conference the month before. But yes, one of the options is that we might do it throughout the year or again next year, just one month before. Let's see. Lots of possibilities. Okay. Okay. So Sujay, how big is this Gitpod machine? Because people can, you know, people, if you have data already, you want to try. You it's can. The, the, the software is there. So you just need to basically copy and paste your data to Do you want folder, to show people you know? how to do that? Yeah, so let's do that. So one suggestion um, is that when you first start up the Gitpod machine, so maybe you could start a new one to show them. Um, if you go to your Mito hi fi page. Jimmy. Just because when you start the first screen, yeah, on that one, so open a new one. At that point, it tells you how large a machine do you want. Now, by default, the third one. Ah, uh, here. The, yeah, choose large, so you'll get a bit. Oh, big. cool. That's like the size of a good laptop, right? Eight cores and 16. Yeah. And then if you say continue, you get a new workspace. So this is also useful for anybody who's not used Gitpod before. If you keep opening up multiple workspaces, you are using up your free hours. So if you open a new tab and you go to gitpod.io, it'll show you all the things that you have open and you can close them one by one. Or after half an hour, they will, if you're not using them, they will die anyway. So it's fine. So you never lose more than half an hour at a time. Uh, but yeah, now you can see that she has one green one, which we were already running and an orange one, which is just starting. And that first one, yeah, you can delete that one because it's an old one that you haven't used in a while. 
Uh, although for two weeks, you can go back to an old one and revive it. So if you have some data in there and you forgot to download it, you can actually recover it. Um, so with a larger machine, yes, you can drag and drop files from your desktop, like a read file, or you can wget a large read set, like a you know Illumin, uh, like from NCBI or EBI, you can get a large you know ten gigabyte file using wget. Don't do it from your desktop, and then use wget or curl or get the data in, and then yes, you could use this to run it in read mode and see what happens. Um, it's definitely possible. Yeah, so let's wait for it to create, or we can, or we can come here. So, so we have this one, uh, which was open before. No, we had this. So you can even create a new folder now. Uh, yeah, because if you create a new uh, machine, it's not going to have all the Docker installed. So you cannot run this. You need to enter in this one, right? So that's oh, the point. Hi. So. Say that again. If you create a new workspace, yeah, you are not going to have all the the Mito High Five. Um... Uh, no, it, that's the nice thing. I don't know if you noticed with Gitpod that if you at the end of the Gitpod link, if you put the GitHub repository okay. that you are using, then it checks out all the code and it checks out the Docker. So each Gitpod is starting whatever software you ask it to start. Does that make sense? So the yes, link yes. we sent you. So uh, can I can I share screen for a second? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, there we go. I have too many things open. There we go. Okay. So in the Mito Hi-Fi thing over here, you know where it says click to launch a Gitpod workspace. Mm -hmm. Now that link is actually not just Gitpod. It also has the extra bit after it that says, go to this GitHub repository, which is BG Academy Mito Hi-Fi, and pick up the configuration file from there. So you're not going to lose the software. You will only lose the software if you remove this part. If you remove this part, then yes, you'll start a new workspace and it'll be empty. But if you keep that part, then you will start a new workspace which has the Mito Hi-Fi software already. And that's what we did in the last session as well. We, In the link, we put, for example, tree val curation for the people who were there in the last session. And it started the software that was necessary for tree val curation. So that's why I like Gitpod because you can point it to a repository and say, pick up the configuration from there. And the other thing I wanted to just quickly point out was that in this uh actual repository oops which is here if i now remove the gitpod.io part it'll actually take you to a normal github repository and in that repository there is a dot gitpod.yaml file that says what do you need to start this software and in this case you only need the docker which obviously if you don't have docker you can't do it then you can use singularity but we have also put this one extra space uh, command, which you might need because we needed it, uh, which is unset Java tool option. So if you find that your Docker is not working for uh, your Git, Mito Hi-Fi is not working when you're using some Java tool that's built in, you might have to put this extra option. And this last command is simply saying, get the example files from uh, this location, which I had just uploaded in one place. So that's all it is. Sorry. Doing it. Okay. So. Yes, yeah, so just show you quickly how to upload files there. So you can use this machine. I mean, you have your, so I think here I created, no, I, have, I haven't created anything because this is the new one, but then I can create a folder in my data, for example, inside lecture examples. Um, and let's say, I want some data. I have a lot of data from lots of species. I don't know, do I have any FASTA files? No, I only have graphs, but let me see. Yeah, I have a FASTA file here, let's say. And I wanna, I mean, this is the final, right? But I mean, just to show you, we can drag and drop, you know, easy. So you basically have the sequence there. So like I have lecture examples here uh, and then I go. So if you have a, a couple of contigs, just give it a go in this machine, you know, it's all there. So you can 
uh, run Mito Hi-Fi and see if, if it works if it works for you. So, so yes, I think that's it. People, do you have more questions? Please ask questions. I don't know who has tried, who is thinking of trying, uh, who has like a very odd species that they will be trying it this on. How is it going? No? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have a plant which is being not very cooperative. So I think I might actually try the OATK pipeline. Yeah, try. And Child. so thank you very much for the suggestion. I, I'm actually not really knowing where to bash my head against with this. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, do that. You know, have a look. You will have a final graph for you. So open it on Bandage. Have a look how the graph structure looks like if it's too complicated. And then later on, if you get a sequence, like a, a faster sequence, then you use Mito Hi-Fi to annotate. Then you have like an annotation, genes and a plot. So then you can, you know, have a look at what's going on. I guess it's a big compliment, nice complementary, complementary tools. But for the assembly, OTK will do a better job with the complex structure of uh, organelles for plants. Thank you. I've got a question. Um, so let's say you've, um, you know, uh, um, assembled your mitochondrial genome. Uh, can you then identify? those reads from your um, from your read set, your whole genome read set, and exclude them from your whole genome assembly so that your, uh, your, your genome assembler isn't, you know, taking those reads and making uh, contigs, you know, that are not the, you know, um, true length, maybe like half a mitochondrial genome, which isn't suggested to be circular. Is, is that worth doing? And can you do it? You can do it, you can do it, but you don't have to because I would just assemble everything. And then after assembly, you identify the contig are mitochondria by blast, for example, and you remove them. Why? Because removing contigs, you have a lower number of contigs than you have a number of reads. Dealing with your reads will always be heavier in a way. And you can also might be removing reads that are numbs because it's like there is an uncertainty there. So I would first assemble everything and then remove after, you know, then you just basically, so I would assemble everything, identify your mitochondria. When you're happy with your mitochondria, you use this as uh, like a blast uh, database or a parameter for you to filter out everything else from your assembly. So Mito Hi-Fi, um, Pack Bio Hi-Fi reads. I think we are all very traumatized with the past <laughs> where we had like lots of very, uh, lots of coverage and erroneous read. And then we sometimes needed to decrease the size of our read data set because it was hard to assemble because of memory and everything. And also for, for like short reads, it was also very, very hard. So we would always clean up reads, right? But we are in a time now that with Pack Bio Hi-Fi reads, you don't need a lot of coverage. So depending on the size of your genome, your pile of reads is not very big. And it will assemble in a few hours and it's much less complex to unentangle contamination or mitochondria after you assemble than before. So you can, you can, you can do both, but um, it works well removing it after it's assembled as well. And, and so what's the best way to pick your contigs then? Uh, because you know, so you can give um, uh, high five, um, sorry, mito high five, a uh, list of contigs from an assembly so what you just just blast them against, um, you know, or do you, or do you just give them all the context, the, the whole assembly? Give them all, give them all, because Mito Hi-Fi is going to blast it for you. So, so yes, yeah, give them all. Yeah, somebody asked that question earlier, I just realized, sorry. It's okay, yeah, no, you just take your, you, it, we are here for that, so you, you should always ask. So you take your, your context from your nuclear assembly and just give it to Mito Hi-Fi, and it's going to find the mitochondria for you. Yeah. There is another tool, oh, sorry, someone. No, there is another tool called Blob Toolkit. <laughs> is that a is that a class about it? Changi, uh, say Changi, uh, Suji. Yeah, we had one on Monday morning, which I wasn't super organized about, but there will be a repeat next Monday at five o'clock, uh, five o'clock UTC time. Uh, so if anybody wants to come for that, uh, what what do you want to say about that? Oh, just how to separate out things. 
Yeah, so Blob Toolkit will evaluate your assembly, right? Giving different things. So you will have quantities of different sizes. It's going to, depending on what you have fitted to it, like mapping of your reads back to your assembly. So basically you will have the different coverages of each context. So things that are not your nuclear assembly tend to have a different coverage. They can be contamination or they can be like an organelle. So you can also identify by that, mm, this seems funky. This is not my nuclear assembly. So Blob Toolkit will show you this. CG content, uh, if you have a different CG content for different contexts, it can be also that you have a contamination. So um, evaluating a genome is a process, no? So it's a process of like, you can you, you do it after you assemble, do it before, but uh, one very nice tool to do this evaluation is uh, Blob Toolkit. Anything else, people? Good. Thank you all for coming. Um, I so my contact is in my in the GitHub page. You can uh, talk to me if you have any questions. If you want to show some results that you have, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and. Really, thank you for, for listening. I hope you enjoy the tool and use it. <laughs>